So we've had 10 or 11 videos so far. We've learned a lot, we've sharpened our knives, and now it's really time to start cutting through the bullshit of our love life. Um, this video is about observing the love in your life. So now we need to start observing the love of our life. That's the first step. It's not time to change our love. It's not time to run this direction or that direction. We need to observe it, okay? And we need to observe it on all three levels. On the material level, the emotional level, and the spiritual level. Because life is a compromise, okay? You're not going to hit 100% on all three of those. You might fail this one, do so good in these ones. Ultimately, life is a compromise of the best for with the best possibility that exists in your life. Okay? Um, and that is true in love as well. The only love that's not a compromise is developing till you can receive the full love of God. Okay? Otherwise, you're going to be in a compromising situation. So you can't just look at the material love and say, oh, this is not really that great, I'm out of here. Okay, you have to look at all three loves and say, okay, how much love am I getting here overall? And then you can decide. You know, we just talked about sex. What if a person, you know, what if you've got a disease? Or someone you're with has a, a disease. And because of that disease, materially they can't be useful to you because there's a high risk of, a higher risk. The higher the risk of getting the disease from a person, the less materially useful that person is for sex. Okay? Because it's never useful to, to catch anything, right? It's hard enough to stay healthy. But if on the emotional level, the sex is so valuable, is so useful, then things can still be worked out. So we have to look at everything on an emotional, material, and spiritual level to get the whole picture. Okay? Alright. <clears throat> now this, we're going to go through a few steps here of observing your life. Okay? Um, you're not judging your life, your love life, you're not judging your lover, you're observing. You're looking at the reality of the situation. Okay? Ideally, do this with your partner in the spirit of communication and in the spirit of awareness, if your partner is into this, okay? It'll um, be better for them if they're present, because then, um, you know, you will be able to get feedback on them and not just live with your own assumptions about them, which can be really incorrect assumptions, okay? We want to drop all judgments, we want to drop all of our needs to be loved, we got to drop all of our needs to be respected, we got to drop all of our needs to be validated. Because we want to observe the truth. If we observe the truth, no matter how sad of a truth it is, we're in a place where we can build and move forward. If we observe the bullshit, you're stuck in bullshit. And that's not a fun place to be. Okay? Remember, you want, to need more, you want to need more love in your life. That's the goal. More love in our lives. Okay? You do not want to need a particular person, a particular job, a particular house, you know, a particular car. You, we want and need more love. Okay? We need the person who offers, you, you know, we need the person who offers us love and who we can offer love to. We need the job that offers us love that we offer love to. That's what we need. Which one is that? That's what we're so much here to discover. You know, as we develop into more loving people, we're here to discover where we can have more love in our lives. Then these two work together. Okay? Alright. Very important point to remember. Only the receiver has the right to say if something is useful to them or not. If something is love to them or not. You don't get to say, I pay the bills, so, you know, you owe me, you know, that's useful to you. It's like, maybe it's not, you know. You don't get to say what's useful to the person. Only the receiver gets to decide what's useful. 
And I've all seen movies where people are trying to tell the other person how wonderful they are in their lives and how because they're so wonderful in their lives they should stay with them. No, only the receiver gets to decide that. So don't debate with your partner if you're discussing this stuff with them. Don't say, well, I love you this way. What's wrong with you? No, just respect. That's not useful to them. Okay? And if what you give them is really who you are, if, if that thing that's not useful is really something that you are, you're just not compatible. That's okay. Don't get love in your life somewhere else. Okay? So only the receiver has the right to say if something's useful to them, because only they know. All right? And don't think that you know more than them and that you're God and that you can figure it out and know what's useful to them when they don't want. If someone says it's not useful to them, it's not at that moment. Because maybe, maybe they need to suffer for another 20 years. Good. Suffering's useful. Okay, let them. It is important to observe the love you have on all levels, material, emotional, and spiritual, before deciding if the love is committable, hard, or charitable as a whole. What's it as a whole? That's your foundation. Okay? And most importantly, is it love actually? Or is it something that's not love? And we don't even have to waste time saying the not love that this is, is this type of not love. We don't need to go through all that. It's really interesting. But at the end of the day, if it's not love, it's not love. If it's love, it's love. We're only interested in what's love. Okay? We don't have to know the 101 forms of not love. Okay? <clears throat> so, we need to start asking ourselves. It's easy to ask on the material level. Start there, because it's usually the most obvious, the most clear. So you ask yourself, how is this person useful to me on a material level? And you can write it down, or you can go to your partner and say, you're useful to me materially, da 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 da. Okay? And then you ask yourself, does it feel good? this usefulness? Is how they are materially useful to me? Does it feel good? They're useful but materially. So one guy, I'm, going, I'm being stereotypical, guy comes home, he brings home a pays check, and you know, he goes, oh, I got a lot of overtime, we got an extra thousand dollars this month, you know, um, you know, I hope, you know, we can do some fun things with it, you know, I love you so much, I'm so glad I was able to you know, bring a little more in for us. So, does that feel good to your partner, you being useful to them? Yes, bringing home money like that feels good to your partner. Most probably would. But what if a guy comes home and says, I've been working my ass all day, bitch, to just feed you and them damn kids. Well, he's useful, he was working all day for you, but does it feel good? Uh-uh, I don't feel good at all. So, whatever is useful, what's the next step? Does it feel good? If it doesn't feel good, it's not committable, sustainable. Okay? Then it's just, okay, I'll deal with it because it's an emergency and I have no other choice, I have no other option, so I'll deal with this unpleasant thing because it's useful. But ideally, we need what feels good so it's committable and sustainable. Okay? And then we have to see, ask, does it feel good to my partner and observe? Is the love they give me that's useful me, is, does it feel good to my partner? So it was really great that my partner built me a dog house for my new puppy. Okay? It was really useful to me and it felt good to know he was willing to do that for me. Um, but was he hating life for the weekend? Was he cussing and, and frustrated and not having any fun? Did it not feel good to him? So we need to observe, does it, does it feel good to our partners to do this for us? You know, we see this in lots of movies, you know, you know, movies with abusive relationships where one person is like forcing the other person to do something that doesn't really feel that good to them, you know? Um, and ideally, ask our partner, did you enjoy, did it feel good to you to build the doghouse for me. Yeah, does it feel good to them? Just ask them. Because we need to observe, but it's better to ask them that. Because, and get the honest response. Because it might not have felt good to them. They might have pretended to make it feel good because they might have been a team player. Okay? 
So ideally ask, does it, did it feel good to you what you just did? It felt good to me, it was useful, but how about you? Did it feel good to you? Because for committable, sustainable, it has to feel good to the giver. For charitable, it has to feel good for the giver. It feels good for the giver too. Hard love doesn't feel really good for anybody. Okay. Then after you get an appreciation of how they're useful on a material level, and after understanding, is this committable and sustainable because it felt good for me and it felt good for him? Or is it something else? And then figure out what that other thing is. Okay. Second question you need to ask, how do I need this person to be useful on a material level? Okay. How do I need this person to be useful on a material level? Okay. Because there's all, like I said, it's a world of compromise. They're, you know, they might be materially useful, but you know, there, there's some big ways that you need them to be materially useful and they're not. Okay. Then ask, is my need realistic? You know? Sometimes we have unrealistic needs, especially on the emotional level. But even on the material level, we can have unrealistic needs, you know? Um, and we have to just ask, is it realistic? If it's not realistic, we have to ask, um, well, say, first, if it is realistic, say you need, um, you know, you guys need more money before you can actually, you know, you, he could be materially useful, she could be materially useful to you. So if you want to have children, he needs to be materially useful in a financial way. Okay? And then you need to ask yourself, is it realistic? All right? For him to um, achieve this. Okay? Um, if it is realistic, great. That means there is potential for the person to be more useful in the future. But don't commit to future potential. We only commit to the now. All that you know is, I need him to be more materially useful, I need her to be more materially useful. But, and the, and the potential is there. Okay? I'm just going to talk classical stereotypes just to make it simple and rednecked here, okay? So the woman's like, I need him to make more money. He's only making this much now. Can he make more in the future? Is it realistically possible? Okay? The guy's like, geez, I really like, like hot babes. It, you know, is it. Is it materially possible for her to look hotter in the future than she looks now? Again, I'm being really superficial here, okay? But even about other things, I really would like, uh, like my rock climbing friend, I really want to go climbing, you know, more intense stuff. Can my partner climb that stuff? No. I, do I need her to? Yeah, I sort of need to, because this is my life. Is it realistically possible that she could climb this stuff in the future? Yeah, she, she could. I won't climb that stuff with her now because I'll die if I do it with her now. But in the future, it's possible. Okay? So, we need to look at if there's potential for it, realistic potential, and if so, um, to recognize that a deeper commitment is possible in the future when that potential matures. But you have to live and commit for the now. Okay? Now let's say um, the need is not realistic. Then you have to ask yourself, why am I having unrealistic needs? Okay. Um, and then how can I fulfill that need in myself? Now on a material level, we don't tend to have really unrealistic needs. Um, we have unrealistic dreams. We go, oh, I wish I had a billion dollars. I could just lay in the sun with you all day, my love. You know, we might have these kind of unrealistic needs, but we're just, you know, saying things. Um, it's on the emotional level, which I'll talk about later, that we tend to have a lot of unrealistic needs. You know, where people really create a lot of unrealistic needs. Um, but even on your material needs, is it realistic? Is what I'm asking actually something the world can give me? Okay. And if it is something the world can give me, that exists in this world, does my partner have the potential for it? And if so, great. There's a possibility of deeper commitment in the future when that potential is realized. Okay? 
If my need's not realistic, why am I having unrealistic needs? Because you have to do some work in yourself. That's why. You have something to work within yourself. And once that's worked out, you won't have unrealistic needs. You'll have needs that can actually be fulfilled on planet Earth. Okay? So after this, the next step you have to ask yourself is, is what I am materially useful to my partner so that I can feel loved and appreciated by my partner for who I am? Right? Because you want to be, we all want to be as useful, as loved as possible. And we only can do that if we're doing what we are. And not only that, we want to feel good when we're being materially useful to someone. And we only can feel good if we're being who we are. So, we need to say, is what I am materially useful to my partner? Is what I am materially useful to my partner? <laughs> I don't even know what I wrote there. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, is how I am, is that materially useful to my partner? Or is what is materially useful to my partner not who I really am? It's really useful to my partner to take me to all of his business parties and put me in those heels and that, and that dress. You know, because everyone wants to come talk to him because there's this, you know, this beautiful item next to him. And so, you know, and then he meets more people to make more deals with and he's, he's just doing so great at work. And, you know, wow, me on his arm is materially useful to him. But I hate high heels. And I hate being an advertising bulletin board. And I, I'd rather be wearing a pair of shorts and be out in the jungle somewhere than... Yeah, you're being materially useful to him, but does it feel good? Okay, is it really who you are? You know? So, we need to observe and see if in the ways we're materially useful to each other, are based on who we really are. Okay? A lot of, lot of relationships have people being materially useful for the other, but in something that they're not. Okay? In all kinds of things they're not. Sure, I'll be mature, I'll help you with that, but that's not really me. I hate it. Okay? Um, that's not going to be sustainable because it doesn't feel good. That'll leave one person feeling dead over the years. Okay? So, uh, is what I am materially useful to my partner? So, what I actually am. Now, if what you really are is not materially useful to your partner, you'll never be able to be appreciated and loved for who you really are, but for something that's secondary, thirdly, fourthly of who you are. Or maybe something that's not you at all. Okay? So, so much of success of love on any level has to do with um, how um, self-aware you are of who you are. You know, it's the foundation. Self-awareness. Love yourself, then love somebody else. Okay? The fourth question is, does it feel good to be and do what is materially useful to my partner? All right, I already answered that. Okay? Um, we're materially useful, does it feel good or not? All right? And all these points I'm going to write below the video in that little section where I can write a couple notes. This will all be written down there to make it a little easier to follow. I couldn't really fit it up here. And my handwriting sucks anyway, so I figure I'd just type it in below. Okay? My handwriting is not useful to anybody. Okay. Then number five, ask yourself, is this is all this sustainable and combinable material love? Or is it hard love? Or is it charitable love? Okay? Be honest. We're observing, have to do it with honesty. You won't get anywhere by lying. You lie about anything to yourself, you're, that just means you're stuck. It's like pouring cement around your ankles and saying you want to fly to love. You won't get there. If there's not much committable, sustainable love, ask yourself, and this is the key question here, why do I want to be with this person? You know, is it self-abuse? Are you trying to have love with the mirror of one of your parents? Are you trying to prove something? Do you just care so much for the person that you can't let go? Care is not love. Love is an action that's useful. Okay? So, try to analyze, say, why am I here then? Okay, and that can lead to a 
Pandora's box of reasons within yourself, um, most of which aren't going to be pretty reasons, okay? But it can lead to um, a lot of self-knowledge that you need so that you can not commit to anything that's not love, okay? Because if you're there and there's not much committable, sustainable love, you know, you're there for reasons of not love. So then you have to explore your psychology. And the thing is, not love generally has a part, a stronger pull on us than love that actually works. Okay? So it's, it takes a lot of honesty and deep introspection to um, see what we're really operating under. Okay? And if, if, you, if, there, if you're getting the check that, wow, this isn't love, what you need to do, the first step where 90% of your, you'll, you'll find the reason why 90% of the time. It's just saying, okay, what about this person is like my parent? That's what you say. What are the similarities? Well, they have the same hair color. Yes. Check. There's a similarity. I mean, I don't care what the similarity is. You know, they have the same tone of voice. They have the same voice timbre. You know? Um, they have a similar posture, you know. They respond to things in similar ways. They have something, they have a behavior. Um, look for that mirror. Remember, mirrors are always you know, like in the house of mirrors. So number is perfectly straight mirrors that get perfectly similar reflections. Look for the distorted mirror where, oh yeah, underneath all that. Oh yeah, that's my mom, that's my dad, that's that person, you know. And realize that 90% of the time you're choosing what's not love because um, it's a mirror of one of your parents. And you're desperate to love that parent to make them happy as your partner. And it doesn't matter if it works. It doesn't matter if it's love. It doesn't matter if it's useful. We're desperate. We're all desperate to be loved by our parents. And we're desperate to love our parents. And that pull is so much of what people call love. That's why love marriages don't work as good as arranged marriages, because they're based on trying to love someone that they can't love, that, or can't be loved. They're trying to love based on that, that, because of everything that went wrong with their parents, you know? And even if something didn't go wrong with parents, a child can just be watching a parent and want to love that parent, make that parent feel good. But that parent's struggling with their own stuff and no one's going to make them feel good. And so the child feels like, oh, I didn't make my mommy or daddy feel good. Here's a person with a similar thing, I'll make them feel good. You know, we make these commitments as, as children to love people like our parents, even if it's not love. Even if we're not useful to them, even if they're not useful to us. That's what most love, not love is. It's just how we work. So we have to divorce ourselves from our parents. We have to say, okay parent, here's some charitable love. Here's a lot more. Love them and leave them. It's not my job. I trust that you can work out your stuff. I don't have to step into that nightmare again with somebody else. Okay? If you're seeing that there's a lot of not love, then you, you know, you're there and there's not a lot of love, you're, and you're, you're, you know, you're, the check boxes of love are like empty or one or two, then it's like, wow, you're not there for reasons of love. And you need to dig deep and heal the reasons that are, you, that are there so that you don't s continue having not love in your life, okay? Okay, then last step is trying to observe all this in respect to your partner's needs. So just try to get it from your partner's point of view. Now, don't assume you're correct. You're going to be wrong about a lot of things, okay? Hopefully you're in a place with your partner that you can communicate with them about this. If you can, great, because then you can really get their experience of what's love to them. If you can't communicate with your partner because they're unwilling to or they're just like angry and drunk half the time, then you have your answer. You make your assumptions, and those assumptions are probably going to cause you to run out of there. Okay? And remember, only the receiver has the right to say if something is useful to them or not. 
if something is love to them or not. This gets this is a really hard step to remember that because we forget it. Because when the partner says, "I feel you," I, you know, I I feel you're useful to me this way, and then the thing that is most important for you to be useful for, they don't mention. You just want to say, "But I'm useful to this you this way." Don't say that. What you can do, you can ask them. When I do this, is that useful to you? You can ask them if you're useful, because they might forget some of the things that you're useful. So you can always ask them, was I useful to you when I did this? Okay? But don't just say, oh, I was useful to you. Not allowed. Only they can say, so ask them questions to remind them if they forgot something. And also just to find out if what you really are, what you really want to do for your partner, is useful to them. Because you don't want to do for your partner what's not what you want to do just so that, you know, you're useful to them and keep them because then it doesn't feel good to you. And then you're not in a committable, sustainable relationship. Okay? So a lot of this course is learning to step um, away from all the things that pull us into not love. All the things that cultures um, who have arranged marriages are so proud of saying our arranged marriages work way better than um, love marriages. Well, those aren't love marriages. Those are desperate needs to experience something called love in places it's never going to be found. Of course, that's not going to work. What we want to do is we want to choose love marriages that are true, that are actually our love and not all that other stuff. Okay? And this course is to help you learn how to make those choices, to have, give you the information and have a foundation to make those choices. To truly make those choices, we have to do those four hard things, which are in the next four videos. There's those four hard things. Those are the things that are pulling us to make choices that are not love. We can't let them make the decision. Um, even after we observe a relationship, those four hard things are going to make us want to choose not love. So we have to, you know, there is a bit of a battle going on here after we observe. So the first thing is observe. So let's go, to the, I want to go through this emotionally and spiritually just so that we cover it from all angles and I repeat myself because this is so important. Okay? So now we just go to the emotional level. You do that with your partner. It might get a little intense. It might get heated. All right, take a break. I think after the material level is done, just don't go to the emotional that day. Sit on it. Some things might come up. You might text them, oh yeah, you're really useful to me this way. And they're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that too, but that really felt good for me too, you know. Keep juggling back and forth as needed on the emotional level, on the material level. <clears throat> Give yourself some time and then tackle the emotional level. Now this is the level that's usually going to be really difficult. Okay, um, because in this day and age, this is the level we're here to work on because this is the level where, honestly, we're just all the most stunted. Okay, this is the age where God said, well, let's take all the emotionally stunted people and see what they can do with each other. And then he dropped so many people. And the funny thing to me is in this day and age, we have a bigger population than Earth has ever had. So it just shows you, um, <laughs> you know, it just shows us how you think of, you know, what, there was the half a billion people 2,000 years ago on the whole planet or something, <clears throat> struggling on material level. Um, and that's all the God, souls God could find who needed to struggle on a material level, you know? And now it's like, well, now that this planet is about struggling on the emotional level, I've got endless amount of people to send down there. <laughs> so, that's what we're here to do. And so, it's going to be, this is always the challenging level. So we ask, how is this person useful on an emotional level? And does it feel good? Is it just useful? Well, I'm growing emotionally, I'm healing emotionally, but it doesn't even feel good. Or am I growing emotionally? And am I healing emotionally? And it feels good. Because remember, ultimately to be useful on an emotional level is it allows us to grow into better versions of ourselves. It gives us the space where we feel loved, we feel accepted, we feel welcomed, and in that space we can allow ourselves to grow into healthier people. Okay? Um, it's not threatening. So, when it comes to emotional usefulness, that's a huge part of it. Okay? Um, and it has to feel good. Alright? 
Then we have to say, does it feel good to my partner? And again, ask them. You've been really emotionally useful to me. How did it feel? And they're like, well, honestly, it's been like just so much. I'm exhausted all the time from it. Or it's like, gosh, oh, it's felt really good. You know, it's, it's caused me to feel so much love to see there and watch your process and to be part of the process. Which of those is happening? Or some variation of that. Okay? If it feels good to your partner and it feels good to you, it can be committable and sustainable emotional love. Okay? Then ask yourself, how do I need this person to be useful on an emotional level? Meaning level they're not yet. And is this a realistic need? I need them to just make me happy all the time. Well, that's not realistic. What do you have to do within yourself to no longer need that? Okay. I need my partner to be responsible for my happiness. Well, that's not really realistic, okay? What can you do so you don't need that unrealistic thing? This happens so much on an emotional level, and it's usually unconscious. So it's hard to reach, okay? It's hard. You need to spend time really thinking, what am I actually expecting my partner to do that he's not doing? And is it even realistic that a human being to do that? Could I do that for a human being? That's the trick question. Could I do it? Would I do it? My definition of selfishness is not robbing 200 people and killing them and leaving their bodies on the street. Okay? My definition of selfishness is robbing 200 people, killing them and leaving them on the street, and then when someone robs you, beg for your life and say, oh, don't kill me, don't kill me. And it's like, look, you did it to everyone, so, you know, don't be selfish and not expect it to be done with you. Selfishness is when we expect someone to treat us differently than we expect them. If we treat them bad and they treat us bad and we're good with it, it's not selfish. <laughs> okay? It's a beautifully bad relationship. So, ask yourself when it comes to, are my, you know, do I have an emotional need? And even do I have a material need? Is this something I would do for someone else? Is this something I could do for someone else? If not, and you're expecting that from someone else, you're being seriously unrealistic. Okay? And then you need to figure out how you can resolve that within yourself so you don't have an unrealistic need. Okay? <clears throat> If it's a realistic need, does the relationship offer the potential for that? I need more quiet time. Okay. It's not happening now because there's so much chaos in our lives with it. We move to a new location, starting new jobs, and da 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 da. Is it realistically possible to have that in the future? Is the potential for more peace and quiet in the future? Whatever. Okay, again, if so, don't commit to that potential. Work towards it, but don't commit to it until it gets there. Okay, don't commit to the future because you're only alive now. All right? Then ask yourself, is what I am emotionally useful to my partner? So the way I just really am, my wacky sense of humor, whatever, um, the way I say things, the way my emotions work, um, Am I emotionally useful to my partner so that, they can, so that you can feel loved and appreciated by your partner for who you are? Okay? Does it feel good to be what is emotionally useful to your partner? When your partner needs some emotional support, does it feel good to give the emotional support? Are you rolling their eyes, your eyes when they're not watching you? You know, does it feel good? to offer emotional support and care when they need it, okay? Does it feel good to take the time to accept them? You know, you have to decide, okay? Then ask yourself, is all this sustainable, committable emotional love, or is it hard love, or is it charitable love? If it's a two-way street and feels good, it's committable, sustainable. If it's one-way street where one person is benefiting emotionally, well, it's useful to one person emotionally, but it's not useful to the other person emotionally, it's not sustainable. Because then the person who it's not useful to emotionally, at some point they're going to need someone who's useful in their life emotionally. And when that person shows up, they're going to have to spend time with that person. Okay? 
Again, be honest. Don't lie about things. You won't get anywhere if you do. And it's hard to be honest about the emotional things because this is the unseen realm. We can make up all kinds of stories here, all right? Um, and we're more lost in this area, so it's easier to assume we're being honest when we're not. So you really need to take a lot of time on this emotional level, okay? <clears throat> Again, and this is the, you know, especially on this level of emotional love, if there's not much committable, sustainable emotional love, ask yourself, why am I with this person? Because this is where we commit these days. We are committing on emotional levels. If we're committed to someone emotionally, if we're in love with them emotionally, and we don't have useful emotional love with them, then we're really off target. Because that's the most important type of love to have in this day and age. Again, what is the self-abuse? Who are you, which parent are you trying to love as a mirror? Okay, you really need to look into all that very, very deeply. Look for the similarities. Look for the charts. You know, get your mom's chart, get your dad's chart, get anyone's chart who had a huge impact on you as a kid. Usually it's your parent. Maybe it's your grandmother, they raised you. Look at their charts. Look at that person's chart and go, oh wow, five of the seven planets are in the same sign. Or three of them, you know. Or they have the same planetary conjunction as my whatever. They have Rahu and Ketu in the same house or the same sign. Saturn in the same place. Their Saturn, their, their Saturn is doing everything to me that my mom Saturn did to me. You know? Because Saturn is what we don't have. So everything your parents didn't give you is their Saturn. They didn't give it to you because they didn't have it. But you still wanted it. Because we want it all. So you meet someone who's got Saturn in the same place as your parent. And it's like saying, oh... This person is um, not giving me the same things my parent couldn't give me, and that's maybe why I want them to give it to me. Whereas the person over here who will give me those things, because they don't have Saturn there, is, um, I don't want it from them. It doesn't feel the same. Because we want what we can't have. We want what's not there. That's a big part of human pathology. Okay? So... If there's not a lot of emotional love, we need to really inquire, why are we there? What are we trying to prove? What, why do we have to be there if it's not love? You know, we'll have reasons, but we're trying to prove ourselves to ourselves because we're trying to prove ourselves to one, someone who raised us, usually one of our parents. And that's more important to us to suffer that than it is to have love in our lives. It's more important than being healthy. It's more important than being vibrant. It's more important than thriving. And that's why we do it, until we recognize what we're doing and realize, actually, it's not more important than that. It was most important to a three, four, five-year-old, but to an adult, we have completely different appraisals of priorities of what's important. But if that part of us hasn't been seen, we haven't recognized it and learned what it was doing, and... Um, given it a place for healing, our inner child, as I like to call it, then, um, you know, that part will be making the choices for us and we won't have love, okay? And especially this happens on an emotional level. If you're emotionally committed to someone and trying to have a sustainable, committable relationship with someone who emotionally you don't have love with, why are you doing it? That's the big thing you have to understand, okay? Try to observe this in respect to your partner's needs. Okay, don't assume you're correct. Communicate with them about this, if they will. Okay? Um, only they can tell you if what you're doing emotionally works for them or not. You don't have permission to tell them what they need. Okay? They don't have permission to tell you what you need and how useful and good you are for them. The most important part of having a conversation on this level with your partner, there's two important parts. Be honest with the facts as they are now. Okay? After that, go back. Were the facts different in the past? Okay? Did we have more or less love to offer in the past? If more, alright, can we offer more love in the future? 
if less, good. We actually have, we're actually offering more love to each other now than we used to. Wonderful, we've grown. There's, there's obviously something useful here if we're doing more of it now than we did in the beginning. Okay? Um, and then, um, and then the, the final thing to do is that takes a really clear look. It's to say, okay, is there potential for more love? Okay? And is that potential great enough to make it worth working for? And then people can commit to working on it, but they can't commit to a relationship yet. Okay, you only can commit to what's now. So if what you have with your partner right now is good enough to commit to on an emotional level, then you can commit to it now. If it's not, but it potentially could be in the future, then good. Work towards that future, but don't commit on that level. Don't commit to potential. You can commit to working towards potential, but don't commit to the relationship on that level if it's not there now. Okay? We do have to work for more in our life. This isn't a free world. We have to work. We have to work on ourselves. We have to work with the people. But we only can commit to what is working in a relationship. Don't commit to what could be working in a relationship. Don't commit to what did work in a relationship. Okay? You've grown. They've grown. Hopefully, everyone's grown. What was a relationship? What worked then? Just may not work now. Let's find out. Okay. So there has to be a lot of honesty in um, discussing what's the potential here. Could you be more emotionally useful to me? What would you need me to be to be more emotionally for you? And let me think if I, that's even within the realm of my way of being. Do, do I even want to be that way? And you might go, gosh, I'd really love to be that way, but I can really see how I'm not. Great. If that's something you really love, would love to be, that shows that that potential is much more reachable. If you're like, yo, yeah, I could be that, but I don't even want to be that. Oh, forget it. There's no potential there. We have to want to be that thing that can offer more love to our partners in the future. Our partner has to want to be the thing that can offer us more love in the future. Okay? Otherwise... They'll just, we'll just be something we're not, and it doesn't feel good to be something we're not. And so then there's no room for committable, sustainable love. Okay? So this has to be discussed very openly. And then, if you're lucky, you'll have checked out. You'll go, okay, there's enough here to commit to as is. And I can see future potential to work towards. So we can have more emotional love in our life. That would be, if you have that, good job. But, since you're watching these videos, there's a very, very, very good chance you don't have that. Or maybe you don't have a partner at all. Okay? You need to look at the facts now. What's, what's here to commit now? And is it something that's worth committing to me now? If so, commit on that level while you work towards the future potential. But if it's not, don't commit on that level. Not to, have to say you might not commit in a future, though. Okay? So realize we're always in a state of change. But we have to live in the present moment. And only commit to what is there now. Alright? Okay. And one of the things that gets so confusing is that there's so many levels on which people can be emotionally useful to us. You know? You're emotionally useful to me as... Um, you know, as when we do things, it's, it's very joyous. But you're not emotionally useful to me when, you know, when I'm emotionally confused. Alright, so now you're emotionally, on one level you are, one level you're not. And you're not emotionally useful to me when I'm stressed about the kids. Or you are emotionally useful to me when I'm stressed about the kids. I mean, where is this way? You are emotionally useful to me when I'm with the kids or you're not. There's all these ways we're emotionally useful. That's why we first have to start with the first steps and say, where's the person emotionally useful? Where do I need them to be emotionally useful? Okay? Um, 
and it'll be so many pluses and minuses, it takes a lot of introspection to say, is this really committable? Okay? Now remember, ultimately, for anything to be committable for the rest of your life, it has to help you heal. It has to help you grow more into yourself. Because why are we here on earth? We're here to grow into healthier versions of ourselves. We're here to recognize our light more than our bullshit, which is not us. We're here to discover who of more, we, more of who we are, not to focus on more of who we're not. So to be a lifetime commitment, your relationship has to provide that. For a 10-year commitment of, yeah, we want to buy a house together and live in Hawaii, sure. You know? For a 20-year commitment of we want children, okay, the, the children become a huge part of are you useful to me on an emotional level to have children with? Are you useful to me on a spiritual level to have children with? Are you useful to me on a material level to have children with? It's a huge part of the equation. But if you're not useful to each other in, in respect to who you're growing into, then what happens when the kids move out? The amount of people who separate when their kids go to college, it's a huge amount. Because they weren't useful to each other in other ways. So always remember the bottom line to every commitment should be, is this person useful to me for my growth? If this is such an important part that it's better to have a life of 50 bad relationships that end after six months to two years that are useful to your growth than a lifetime relationship that's not useful to your growth. Because what we're here is to grow. That's the bottom line of usefulness. Okay? So always question that. Materially, is this person useful to them way to me in a way that really allows me to get, have the opportunity to thrive emotionally and to thrive spiritually. Because when the material usefulness purpose is to give us the lack of stress, the peace of mind, so we can thrive emotionally and we can thrive or work on thriving emotionally and work on thriving spiritually instead of just working on feeding ourselves. See, in the dark ages, people didn't worry about emotions as much as I like to joke about it. They didn't worry about it because they were so struggling to survive on a material level. But once the material level's done, or you know, good enough that you're not you know, going to bed hungry every night, then right away it's like, wait a minute, there's a whole other part of me that needs to be fulfilled. And now I really have to get focused. Now the hard start, job starts, okay? So, um, is it useful to your growth and healing? That's the biggest gift that we can give each other ultimately, you know. Um, so with every question, ask yourself that always as part of the equation. They're useful to me this, this, and this way, but are they useful to my growth and my healing? Okay? Because that's what life is setting us up for. And the thing is, everyone is useful to our growth and healing. But is it in a sustainable, committable way? Does it feel good? You know, even our abusers are here to show us, boom, why are you letting me punch you? What's wrong with you? How, what is it in you that makes you feel like you deserve to get punched? And they will keep punching us and kicking us and hurting us until we go, wow, that abuse was really useful in helping me figure out why I would let this happen to me. Knowing that is extremely useful to your growth. Okay? God doesn't waste humans. Even in the most ugly situations, he's using humans to um, prompt growth in all of us. But again, we want committable, sustainable, which means it has to feel good. <laughs> okay? Alright, so, the emotional levels we need to take the most care in. And you know, it could take, it could take weeks to discuss the emotional level with your partner. It could take weeks to sort out emotional usefulness in your partner where they're useful, how they're not useful to emotionally. I mean, this is a huge, very confused area. And it's the area that's most confused because we go into it with all of our ideas of what's not love, all of our cravings for what's not love, all our desires to escape the pain in the world in a place that it can't be escaped. 
to where a place where it's only going to be met firsthand. Okay. All right. Then we start on the spiritual level. How is this person useful to me on a spiritual level? Which means, how is this person useful to me to spread love and light? Okay? It's not the most important one. And it's not even one you care about until you get the emotional worked out. Once the emotional is worked out, then this becomes like a consideration. Because it's like, if we're not moving forward in life with love and our partner, we're stuck and we're moving backwards. So once, just like once the material level gets worked out and a person's not starving all the time, they immediately realize the need for emotional fulfillment. Once a person's emotionally fulfilled, they immediately realize the need to, um, for spiritual fulfillment. And if what has given them emotional fulfillment or what has given them material fulfillment doesn't allow them to have spiritual fulfillment, then it becomes jail. What was useful on one level can become jail on the next level. So a person needs to be materially fulfilled and they get a job and they work, work, work 70 hours a week. They have no time to even feel anything, but they have all this money and all a big house now and money in the bank. That was materially useful. But to continue that wouldn't be useful. Now it's time to work 10 hours a week, just manage their affairs and get in touch with their feelings all over again and see what, 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 what their heart has to say about their lives. And, and then the emotionally useful things are the priorities. And once that's filled, it's like, okay, now the most important things are my spiritual life. So these things that have been emotionally fulfilling, and which were emotionally necessary, and which helped me grow and heal, they're not what I need anymore. I don't want to see that person that much. I want to go meditate. I want to go on a retreat. I want to whatever. So there's a point as we succeed in our material and emotional lives, that the next natural question is, how do I fulfill this other thing? Because there's still something else. And you're not going to fulfill it anywhere in the world. People try. You know, people try it in all kinds of crazy ways. I need to, know how to, go, need to go there. And none of them succeed. So how to succeed spiritually? Does our partner... Give us what we need to succeed spiritually. That could mean just, oh yeah, go ahead and meditate every night. I'll see you two hours less a night. You know? Um, go on retreat when you need to. That's being supportive of a person's spiritual. That's useful spiritually to have a partner that says that. You know? Um, I've had a lot of clients who've come in and um, I remember one client in particular, she had a, a husband who was a great guy. He came from a traditional family, had traditional beliefs, they had great kids together, he was a great father, he was a great provider, he celebrated all the anniversaries, all the birthdays, just was really happy to share that, really gregarious, great guy. But he thought meditation was stupid. So what does she do? She has an affair with a guy who meditates all the time, <laughs> you know? It started out as just as two people doing things together spiritually and it turns into a sexual relationship. Okay? Because at the end, whatever level we're working on, we want to have sex with the people we're working on that level with. Like sex is almost a celebration of, oh yeah, we succeeded materially, let's celebrate with material success. Oh, we succeeded emotionally, let's celebrate with emotional success. Oh, we succeeded spiritually, let's celebrate with, you know, sex. It's like this candle we like to put on every cake. And um, so this, of course, caused a huge problem in her, her life, okay? And she'd been happy with this guy for over 20 years. But then it got to the point where it was time and he wasn't spiritually useful to her. So we need to be useful on this level at times. And when our partner needs us to be spiritually useful, it's usually the easiest thing to do. It usually takes the least work, because most of what needs to be done spiritually needs to be done alone. Okay? So, um, it's often a matter is, is my partner spiritually unuseful to me? Okay? But, it's a really wonderful thing if they're truly spiritually useful to you in a way that's them. So they're, you know, it's again, okay, 
yeah, go ahead, go on the retreat. I don't care. I'll just be at home doing my thing. You know, okay, they're being useful, not causing you trouble, but that's different than really being there with you, really committing to the same spiritual growth or whatever, or some form of spiritual growth. So, if two people can actually have a spiritual partnership, where they're actually supporting each other in a more active way um, to shine their light on the world, that's really, really nice. But honestly, it's rarely that way. Because so often the way that people have to spread their light to this world, so often people's spiritual paths are so really, really different. And in the day, it's so easy to love someone who's working on their spiritual life. It's so easy to love someone who's shining their light more day by day. That we don't, and that's such so beneficial for everyone around them that you don't need to like actually be holding their hands through that. If you're a lucky person, an unusual person who finds that, great. But it's not normal, okay? It's the spiritual path is so individual. At the end of the day, it's the most individual path. And the most ironic thing about it is, <laughs> we have these religions that say, everyone do it this way, yet it's the most individual path. You know? Makes no sense at all. Um, so spiritually useful, so much is, so, is mostly about believing in the other person, um, that they can grow spiritually, the things they're doing spiritually, that the light they have is worth shining, that the light they have in themselves is worth discovering, and once discovered is worth sharing. Okay? And um, however it's shared, you know, with words, with smiles, with pictures, who knows? Okay? Um, all right, so we say, is this person useful on a spiritual level? And does it feel good? Does it feel good to your partner? Do they say, oh, okay, go meditate, and they're, and they're like, I was so lonely, you were gone the whole time, I really missed you. And it's not like they're just saying, oh, I really missed you in a playful way, but they're like, really, it really felt horrible that you were gone for a weekend, okay? Because you have this spiritual stuff to do. It doesn't feel good to them, even if they give it. Then eventually, that'll return to resentment. It won't be sustainable, okay? How do I need this person to be useful on a spiritual level? It depends. It depends on how you're shining your light in this world, how much of you is shining your light on this world. There are some people who shine their light in the world all day long, every day. That's all they do. Other people just want to do it five minutes a day. So it really depends on your own unique place. Okay? Is it a realistic need? Is it realistic to expect a person to provide this to me. All right? If it's not, how can I healthily fulfill this within myself? Oh, I need a partner to meditate with me. Uh, why? You know? I need a person to pray with me. Well, is that realistic? Well, yeah, it's realistic. Uh-uh, I'm going to say it's not realistic because there's a story when St. Francis was walking down the street with one of his brothers and someone ran up to St. Francis and said, you know, my husband is ill, you know, I'm worried he's going to die, you'll pray for him. And St. Francis said, of course I'll pray for him. As soon as they got around the corner, and that lady was out of sight, St. Francis drops to his knees in the middle of the street, starts praying for, starts praying. And brother's like, why are you doing that? What's wrong with you? Just, why are you praying here? He goes, well, I promised that woman I would pray. And when we make promises like this, we have the tension at that moment to do it. But within a short time, things will happen and we'll, we'll lose the fervor. We have to do it right away when that fervor is there. It's like that. When you need to pray and you have fervor to pray, you have to pray then. When you want to meditate deeply, you have the fervor to meditate deeply, you have to do it then. Your partner and I might not have it right then. Your partner might be standing there like that monk next to St. Francis going, uh, dude, why are you kneeling in the street and praying? all of a sudden, you know, you're trying to keep the village from being destroyed or something, you know. So, there needs to be, it's such an independent thing, you know. It's about the light of your soul, and when it wants to turn on, it wants to turn on. When you have something to say, that's beautiful. When you have, you want, you need to pray and bring light to the world through prayer or meditation, and your partner's like, oh, but we had this scheduled. Well, geez, 
when it comes to spiritual fervor, you can't really stop that stuff. It has to happen, it has to happen then. It won't have the intensity later. You can't delay it. Okay? And to delay it makes you spiritually sick. Okay? Because you're not getting an experience that you could have had of the divine flowing through you for a moment. Okay? So, um, you know, it's not realistic to say I want someone to pray with me all the time when I need to pray. No, it's not realistic at all. It's realistic that they pray the way they need to when they need to and you pray the way you need to and they do. And to support each other in that. Say, oh yeah, I get it, you have to do that. I'll, I'll handle this material overload. You go to work early. You go home early and finish writing that chapter. Oh, I just got this. It's all coming to me, this chapter I've been working on for weeks. It's just all coming together. And, the, and it's like the partner goes, yeah, I know. We have so much to do today. I've got to pick up the kids, cook dinner, do the laundry. And we were going to fix this and do that together. But screw it. I'll take care of as much of that as I can. Whatever doesn't get done, doesn't get done. Write that chapter. And that's being spiritually useful. Okay? It's rare that people will give that to each other. Yet, it's like the easiest thing to give. Okay? So when you question yourself about spiritual usefulness, look at those subtle, very important aspects. Okay? Um, and if you're spiritually useful hand in hand in some things, if you share a light that you can share together, that you can shine together, like dual head beams, cool. Will that make it any more special? Yeah, not really, you know, because spiritual usefulness is all about shining your light. And if your spiritual usefulness is going to be of shining a light with someone, you'll have someone to shine the light with. But that's not usually how people are spiritually useful, to shine lights together. Okay, if your unique way of being spiritually useful is to shine a light with someone, you'll get it. Um, but if not, you won't get it. So don't complain about it, okay? But just ask, are they spiritually useful? How do I need them to be spiritually useful? Well, you usually have those needs when they're not being spiritually useful. And you may also have those needs if they're unrealistic, okay? And then you need to ask, why do you need someone to help you with what you can only do, all right? Because at the end of the day, we're all responsible for our own spiritual lives. Um, perhaps more so than any other part, of, definitely more so than any other part of our lives, okay? The beautiful thing about spiritual usefulness is simply by shining your light, you're spiritual use, spiritually useful to the people around you. It's like everything else. Um, to be emotionally useful, we have to have emotional commodities. To be spiritually useful, we have to have spiritual commodities. And then, Unlike emotions and everything else where we have to do all this give and take to be useful to each other, even when we have the commodity, when we're spiritually useful to ourselves, when we have the commodity of spiritual usefulness, we're useful to everyone who's like around us. That's why there's yogis meditating in the Himalayas who never talk to anyone. They're like making a huge difference in the world. Okay? So, this is a fun one to question. So, ultimately, if you have the commodity to be a spiritually useful person, which means you're shining your light, you're, you're discovering your light, you're, you're digging to find your light, you're, you're um, following your light and finding more of it, then you're automatically spiritually, use, spiritually useful to your partner, and they're automatically spiritually useful to you. Okay? Even if on the surface, materially, it doesn't look like a spiritual usefulness. Like, they're a Buddhist and you're not. Or something, you know, it's like, oh, how can we be spiritually useful? Well, materially, you can't be. You can't go to the same temple. You won't go to the same retreat center. That's going to the same retreat center is materially useful. You only have to drive halfway. And someone else drives the other half. But the spiritual usefulness comes when you show up with the commodity. It really is the easiest place to be useful. It's like sex and having kids. It just kind of happens, you know? <laughs> you know? If you have sex, kids show up. You know? So, um, it becomes spiritually useful. You're shining light in life just by doing the thing. So, um, but it's still good to question this area of your life. And um, to a lot of people, this area of their life doesn't really matter. 
okay? Um, one day it will, and you never know when it will, though. And one day when it does matter, you'll need to ask yourself, is my relationship spiritually useful to me or not? Okay? All right. And then ask yourself, is a spiritual love, hard, you know, hard love, committable love, or whatever? If you're working on your light, and they're not working on their light, then it's charitable love. You're being spiritually useful to them, they're not being spiritually useful to you. Like Lahiri Mayasaya. I told you the story where his wife got upset at him and was, I'm sorry, yelling at him, tried, you know, giving him a good tongue lashing for not spending enough time with her and the family because he's spending all this time with his devotees. And then he, poof, just disappeared into thin air. She's like, oh my gosh. And she realized who she was talking to, and then he reappeared. He goes, um, I couldn't show you who I was until now because I've been working with your karmic entanglements, with your karmic strings. I've been burning these things in the background for you until you are ready to see me who I really am. So all this time, he was being spiritually useful to her. She wasn't being spiritually useful to him. Okay, um, That's what gurus do. They're being spiritually useful to us, and all we are is material work, you know, all these things, like not material work, work on the astral plane for them, untangling little knots to help us along, and without um, us even knowing it. So, when we are shining our own light, when we're discovering our own spirituality, when we're getting in touch with that, we're automatically spiritually useful for the people with us. Okay? All right. Um, but it may be charitable love. It may be, okay, they're, you're spiritually useful to them, but they're not spiritually useful to you because they're not cultivating their life. That's okay. There's someone out there who's spiritually useful to you. Okay, your gurus, your teachers, friends, you don't need to form an intimate or sexual relationship based on spiritual usefulness. In fact, when people are just spiritually useful to each other, they don't want to have a relationship with each other. There's no point to it. They're not going to go, oh, you're so spiritually useful to me that I want to marry you. You know, it's like, no, there's, it's the other levels that make us want to be intimate with somebody. If it's just happening on a spiritual level, um, if the usefulness is just on a spiritual level, no, there's not any reason to do anything else. Okay? It's an interesting story when Yogananda went to see um, um, St. Teresa of Germany. I don't remember what city she was from, but she had the stigmata. And, um, you know, he went to go see her and, and you know, he, he knocks on the door, the housekeeper comes out and says, oh no, she can't see anyone because she was very old and ill and frail. And he goes, she's starting to say, no, he can't see. And then the lady goes, let the holy man from India in. And she just knew the holy man from India had come. Not like she was looking out the window or anything. So Yogananda comes in, the housekeeper leaves, and um, they just sit in silence for a few hours. And then the people Yogananda brought with are waiting in the car. And they just sit in silence, they don't say anything, they don't discuss anything, they don't even share tea and chocolates, you know. Um, and then he leaves. You know, that's really, the, the, that's spiritual usefulness. That's a perfect example of spiritual usefulness. He came all the way there to see her, to do absolutely nothing, except share some vibes. And we can't not share vibes. It just happens through proximity, okay? So, um, yeah, I don't know. What else can I say? It's simple. It can be just like that. See if you're, okay, so you can always get spiritual usefulness from other people. And when that, if that's all there is, if that's all the usefulness there is, there's no need to have anything else with them. There's no desire to have anything else with them. You'll be looking at yourself and say, wow, this is a beautiful chick. This is a handsome man. But you know, there's nothing else there. How can this be? It's because you're spiritually useful. Your souls are saying, we're just here to give each other some vibes for some reason or maybe to support each other a little bit, or I support you a little, you support me a little in shedding light. Um, and those are wonderful relationships. So if you don't have this in your partnership, you can find it all over the place. 
okay? All right. Um, all right, once you've understood, once you've looked at everything, observed everything, the hard part is thinking, what do I want my commitment level to be? Now you get to choose your commitment level. Can I commit on the emotional level? Is it useful enough to me, does it feel good enough to me to commit on the emotional level? Or sorry, on the material level. Does it feel good enough to my partner and does it feel good enough to them to commit to me on a, a material level? Okay, yes or no? If no, don't say, all right, see ya. Okay, just find out. Is it worth committing to? If not, is it worth committing to if more potential is unleashed? Okay, and if so, you can commit to working towards that potential. Okay, then go to the emotional level. Is what's here emotionally, is the emotional use here, and does it feel good that um, it's worth committing to? If yes, great. But don't just say, okay, will you marry me? Yeah. Well, look at everything. If not, say, okay, is there potential to be more emotionally useful to each other? Is that potential there? Okay. If so, can I commit to working towards that potential? When you work towards potential, you're not committing to a relationship. You're working towards a potential relationship. Okay. Even if you don't get there, that's okay. Because the human right is towards activity, towards work. The fruits are given by God. And it doesn't matter, you know, where you're working, who you're working with, it never goes to waste. So there's no, nothing wasted in working to get potential with a person. But it's not good to commit to something that's not working. Okay? So keep that clear, it's really important. So you check that out on the emotional level. Then on the spiritual level, you go, what's here for me spiritually? Is it emotionally, um, is there spiritually something I can commit to here to have a committable, sustainable relationship? And if there's nothing else on the other two levels, say, all right, there is, and I'll keep it on the level, this is simple level, this easy level, okay? And looking at all those, you're gonna see this picture of where you're committed, where you're not, or where, where there's, where you're committable, where you're not committable, what, where deeper commitment could come once potentials are developed. And then you have to make the hard decision of what level will I commit on? The material level is not really worth committing on, but the emotional level is so good that it makes up for the lack in the material level. It might be like that, you know? The value I get emotionally is greater than the lack that's happening materially here. So you have to see, look at the whole picture. And it will be a compromise, okay? But if the whole picture is good enough, it'll be a picture you can commit to and keep. And you need to get clear on yourself and clear with your partner, I can commit to you on this level. And really, commitment, I keep talking about it as a choice, but it's not. It's really not a choice. See, if you, we only can commit to what works. If something's not working, we always will get pulled away. Okay, like the woman, she had a relationship working on the material level. She had a relationship working on an emotional level. But, she had a non-working relationship on a spiritual level. He thought all that stuff she was doing, all the things she was interested in that had to do with love and light were stupid. Like, pff, dismissible. Okay? Well, that's not validating to her path of love and light. So, of course, that made her open to love on another, to, to someone else, who she happened to have an attraction to on a physical level, who she found out she had an affinity on an emotional level. And the only reason she even entertained knowing that person was because she was feeling beat down on a spiritual level by her husband. Okay? So, if something's working on a material level, but not working on an emotional level, it's just a matter of time before someone will meet someone that it does work with on an emotional level. And then they can't be committable. So you have to, when, you're, when we're saying, I can commit to you on this level or not, what you're really saying is, 
what's here is good enough that I won't need, I won't get pulled away by an external influence. Because if there's not enough, you will get pulled away. And it doesn't matter who you are, you'll get pulled away. Or you'll get sick because you're not getting pulled away. Okay? So, we're not even making a choice of where we're commit. We're only recognizing, yes, this is committable versus this is not committable. Okay? Committing to something that is not committable will not be a commitment. You will not succeed. It won't be committable. I'm talking about committable not as something you say or promise, but committable and sustainable as a fact. And it takes a lot to discern that. How do you discern that? Through experience. Through experience of life, of the knowingness of what is possible and what is not possible. Okay? So, it takes time to grow up and recognize a situation that's committable, that I could be her happy. And no, it is a compromise, but it's a compromise that I don't, won't ever have to leave. Versus, there's something here that's really missing that I know I will not be able to stay here and be sustained and committed here. Something will pull me away. I won't be able to be here in this way. And those are just the facts. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's like if you put an animal in a, in a, you know, on a piece of land that's a beautiful piece of land that doesn't have the food it needs, it will have no choice but to leave no matter how much it wants to stay in that land. It'll travel through sheer terror and sheer destruction to get to a land where it can eat. And we're no different. Okay, we're no different than that. So, it comes down to knowing ourselves, to knowing what our real needs are enough. And one of the great things about doing this exercise, it lets you discover clearly, oh, these are what my needs really are. This is what where I could actually work. This is the nourishment I really need. This is what is really going to be useful to me to where I will not want to or need to or be forced into a different country or a different type of land to survive. Okay. So as always, our relationships are dependent on our own self-awareness, our own self-knowledge, how much we know about ourselves. So you should do this with every relationship you've ever had. Go through these steps. Learn about yourself. See why you couldn't stay there. Oh, no wonder I couldn't make that relationship work. No wonder they couldn't make it work. I wasn't giving this to them. She wasn't just a fucking bitch. Wow. That she wasn't a whore or a slut and he wasn't a womanizing fiend. It was just a big thing that was, there was something that needed to be useful that wasn't there. And so the door for them to walk out of my life was there from the beginning. Or maybe not from the beginning, but showed up at some point. Okay? Um, it can be really healing to go through this with your partners. Um, not Even not present ones, but with your past partners. And just, okay, let me look at this relationship. Oh wow, I was so in love with that person and yet there's hardly any useful check boxes. Let me discover, what about them? Oh wow. Their middle name was the same name as my mother. Oh my gosh. You know, it's like, okay, look for the similarities. And then look deeper. And then you look, oh, they have the same sun sign and the same Rahu as my mother. And then it's like, oh, okay, so I can see why I was pulled into that. And I understand that it wasn't love and there was no loss. There was no real loss because I didn't lose anything useful. I never had something useful or only had so much useful. And I have so much more useful now. And it can be a really healing experience to do this and an experience of gaining greater self-knowledge. And then if you, if every relationship checks out, it's like, okay, not useful, not useful, not useful. And you're like, oh my God, I actually suffered over these things. Ask yourself, why? Why did you do that to yourself? Why did you limit yourself to that experiences? And then you can unlock a lot of insights about um, how you're not allowing love in your life, how instead you're allowing other things in your life. And this can lead to a huge psychological 
um, multiple psychological insights, years of discoveries that are going to make the critical difference in your life. So I really suggest everyone go through this. With every relationship, particularly on the material and emotional levels, it's really an interesting thing um, I've seen. That I, again, so much is happening on an emotional level, but so much is on a material level. I remember one person um, who, was all, who you know, grew up in poverty. They were always stressed about money. This person had a remarkable ability to break it up with her boyfriend right before they became sexful, successful and wealthy. It's like, what? It's like, I mean, if you want to be, get wealthy, you date this girl and, and then you break up with her and then you become wealthy. It was like, that's how it worked for this girl, you know? So she had this thing that she would be drawn to wealth potential, but never get it. And there's a whole story of psychology there. And like we're talking right after she leaves, their lives change within six months to a year, or even less sometimes. So why is that happening? There's a theme there, something to understand. That's an omen of a person who will not give herself material well-being. That's a person who finds a way to sabotage their material well-being in their own actions, in their own doings. And it shows by that she attracts a guy with potential and abandons it before it's realized, for one reason or another. The reasons are often different, but the theme is always there. Okay? So they're maintaining this idea, I don't deserve money. I grew up in a poor situation because I didn't deserve wealth, I didn't deserve to have enough money to even have a decent lunch, and I still don't deserve it. I'm not allowing my deserving it. Why? They need to explore that. Okay? So lots of knowledge by studying that material level. Why am I not getting these material things? What thoughts am I holding that says, you're bad to want those, you're bad to have those, you don't get to have those things. Okay? Okay, enough on this. So this is a part you need to really embrace and work through. Um, when you, um, the next videos are the four hard things. Once you get this awareness and you observe, now you have to deal with these four hard things. These are the gut-wrenching things. These are things your heart does not want you to do. And your heart will call them love. Your de old definition of love is that thing in your heart that doesn't want you to do this. That's not love. So we have, I'm going to discuss very um, heavily those four hard things to do. Okay, thank you.